Welcome to the seventh study in our look at chapter two of John's first epistle. We live in a world of hackers. When I was young, a hacker was a rough and aggressive opponent on the football pitch. But today, as you'll realize, a hacker is someone who can infiltrate the highest levels of government or bring a major multinational company to its knees. These highly skilled individuals are able to access computer systems, bypassing firewalls and anti-malware programs, causing all manner of harm to vital systems. 2,000 years ago, when John penned this letter, there was a different kind of hacker. The apostle faced the threat of those who infiltrated the hearts and minds of believers and turned them away from the truth of the gospel and towards all kinds of lies and errors in doctrine. And it is this danger that John is seeking to address in these verses. And while those early decades of the church were times of fierce persecution, the relentless cruelty of Roman emperors could not quench the fire of faith. Indeed, persecution was like a fan to the flames. As Tertullian famously said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It wasn't persecution from without, but the infiltration of heresies from within that caused the church its greatest harm. You'll need to fasten your seatbelts in this study. We're going to wrestle with incarnational Christology, overrealized eschatology, and binitarianism to name but a few of the things we'll be visiting. But before we turn to God's word, let's pause together in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we want to hear you speak to us. We need your wisdom for living. We need your direction in a world that lays many twisted paths before us. We need to hear your truth because you are truth. And knowing you, loving you, living for you, may we walk in truth. Speak through your word. Give us responsive and obedient hearts, we pray. By the enabling of your Holy Spirit, we ask. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our study will be on verses 21 to 25 of 1 John chapter 2. Let's read those together. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. May God bless his word to us as we study it together. Verse 21. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. We finished last week's study in verse 21, but I want to begin there this week since it's both a, a suitable conclusion to last week's thoughts and an introduction to this week's. John claims in this verse, as David Jackman points out, every Christian knows the truth because without it, he could not be a Christian. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 60 years and have doctorates in theology or you've just come to faith in the last week and you have a very basic education. To be saved, to be a Christian, you must know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you know the truth because he is truth and in him alone is truth. And this Exclusivity is our spur to mission. We desire to make Jesus and his gospel known. 
because salvation is in no one else, since there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, as we read in Acts 4 verse 12. The church in this generation has been made guardian of the truth of the gospel, a truth that we strive to teach to the next generation within the church and to proclaim to a perishing world beyond its walls. It is almost a paradox that we at the same time cling to the truth of God's word and yet fling its message far and wide. The Apostle Paul urged Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 saying follow the pattern or hold fast to the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Paul encourages Timothy to hold tightly to the truth of the gospel that he had learned from Paul and he had to defend it. But also he had to declare it, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season to Timothy 4 and verse 2. God's people in every generation are not looking for new and novel ideas, but for a clear and consistent reiteration of the gospel, as we might sing on occasion. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon the early dew of morning has passed away at noon. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. John writes in this verse that no lie is of the truth. And Jesus made it very clear as to where the source of lies is to be found. Acts 8 verse 44, they all trace their root back to the devil. And John continues helping us to see the nature of the lies that our enemy seeks to propagate. Verse 22, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Let me remind you of the error of Docetism. We've mentioned this a number of times in our studies in 1 John. Docetists believe that since the material is corrupted and sinful, only the spiritual can be pure and holy. And it would therefore be Impossible for the sinless Son of God to come into the world and take to himself human flesh. But rather they argue that he only seemed to be human, in Greek, dokeo, meaning to seem, hence their name. And they posited ideas such as that the man Jesus was firstborn son of Joseph and Mary, and at a time he was filled with the Spirit, probably at his baptism, and then before his death, on the cross, the spirit withdrew and, and thus as a man, he was buried and there he remained. These docetists denied incarnational Christology. That Jesus, being fully God, came into this world bearing human flesh. And this, this truth is central to our faith. I'm sure some of you have visited Israel where you can sail on the Sea of Galilee and stand on the shore where Jesus taught the crowds. You can visit the site of the stable of Bethlehem, see the birthplace, or visit the now empty burial place of the Messiah in Jerusalem. The faith that Christians profess is not a myth, but is a historical reality. That the timeless God stepped into time, walked on this earth and died shedding human blood as the only fitting sacrifice for our sins. As Presbyterians, we believe and confess that Jesus is the eternal Son and that he bears two natures in one, human and divine. The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 8 and paragraph 2 puts it like this. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon himself man's nature, 
with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her substance, so that two whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition or confusion. Which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. And this this big chapter in the confession is is summarized and simplified in two catechism questions. Question 21 of the Shorter Catechism. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Question 22. How did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Answer. Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her yet without sin. This core doctrine of the faith, the truth of the incarnation, has been the battleground throughout the centuries. And John is going to deal with it further as he circles around once again and reconsiders this theme in chapter 4. And there is an ever-present danger from those who would want to teach something contrary to this central doctrine. As John Stott commented, the heretic's theology is not just defective, it is diabolical, that is, of the devil. And you will meet these erroneous doctrines within the cults today. When the Jehovah's Witnesses arrive at your door, they will attempt to lead you to believe that they are perfectly orthodox in their understanding of who Jesus is. But if you press them just a little, you will realise that this is a lie. It's not that long ago that I encountered someone I was visiting and uh, they came to the door of the home where I was and I think the homeowner was really glad I was there to answer the door uh, and to to greet and to speak to them. And really they said, we believe the same things about Jesus as you do. But once they were pressed, it became evident that that was not the truth, but rather a lie. Rather, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is God's firstborn son, created by God and inferior to God. And the Jehovah Witnesses, lovely people that they are, are some of these antichrists of whom John writes. When we start to confront the proliferation of religions that are now being advocated and advanced throughout our nation, we will find plenty of people who are more than happy to speak about God with us. They too believe in a creator God. They suggest that we're all going to go to heaven, maybe journeying on different roads, but they'll all get us there. And it is as if there's no problem until we arrive at the issue of our understanding of the person of Jesus. Adherents of these other faiths will eagerly admire Jesus. They will delight and laud at his teaching. They may even call him a prophet, but they will not worship him as God. In a book entitled Dissonant Voices, Religious pluralism and the question of truth. Harold Netland writes, No serious discussion of the relation of Christianity to other faiths can proceed very far without coming to grips with the towering figure of Jesus. Sooner or later, the blunt question put by Jesus to his followers, Who do people say I am? must be considered. And our answer must be that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, two distinct natures in one and without sin. Our text continues, verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 
in answer to Thomas's question about knowing the way to where Jesus was going, we read familiar words in John 14 verses 6 and 7. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And why there were those who were peddling alternate ways to God through the knowledge of secret things. Jesus makes it clear and John reiterates it here that there is no alternative route to the Father except through the Son. It's almost 30 years now, but uh, back then, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland gave a major report to Freemasonry, criticising its practice as incompatible with Christianity, since they deny the Son. The publication of that report led to some ministers, myself included, being taken aside and quietly reminded of, who pays your salary, suggesting that without the support of Masons, the congregation could not survive. Freemasonry makes much of God, but deliberately, distinctively, it makes no mention of Jesus. And to deny the Son, as John makes clear, is to close yourself off from access to the Father. You cannot have one without the other. Our only hope of approach to God the Father is through the mediatorial work of God the Son. He alone can reconcile us and it is not possible for us to know the Father except for the Son. To put it in a more practical way, you can imagine someone say, I really like you, but I can't stand your wife. It's a good thing that you and I can still be best friends don't think so. That's not going to happen. If they love you, they must also love the one you love, the one with whom you've entered into a one flesh bond. In such a case, you cannot have friendship with one without the other. The two are indivisible. You cannot love God, the Father, while disregarding or disrespecting God the Son. John's words again. No one who denies the Son has the Father. The Apostle Paul warns in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, if we deny him, he will also deny us. Is it not true that we have all at some time or other in our lives denied the Son? Have you not been in company when someone has taken the Lord's name in vain? But you have kept quiet, choosing not to rebuke them for disdaining your Saviour. When John here writes, no one who denies the Son has the Father, he means that there's a continuous and unbroken practice of denial. Not that that excuses our failures, but it does comfort us to know that they can be forgiven. We must be bold in our witness to Christ, not denying him. You've heard before of the testimony of Polycarp, the elderly bishop of Smyrna. He was dragged by the Roman authorities before the baying crowd in the amphitheatre. And as he was on his way, Polycarp heard a voice telling him, be strong, play the man. Once there in the amphitheatre, the governor invited him to denounce the atheists, meaning Christians who worship an unseen God, hence atheists. And so Polycarp raised his hand and pointed to the crowds and said, away with the atheists. Again, the governor, attempting to be respectful of this man, now very advanced in years, asked him, please deny Christ. And if you will do this, we will spare your life. But the faithful bishop, gave his famous answer, saying, Four score and six years have I served him, and he has never done me injury. How then can I now blaspheme my king and my saviour? Polycarp 
would not deny Jesus. As a consequence, he perished, being burned to death. May we too have such resolve not to deny him before the world. Verse 24. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. If the truth of the gospel has a secure place in your heart, then you have a secure place with the Father and the Son. As I mentioned last week and many times before, we're back to John's favourite word and favourite concept, to meno, in Greek here, to abide. Or it might be helpfully rendered reside or, or take up residence. It's found three times in this single verse. And again, it's that reiteration of the continuity test that we have been considering in the last three studies. The great quest to remain steadfast in doctrine and not tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes, as Paul writes in Ephesians 4 and verse 14. This is knowing the truth holding to the truth and declaring the truth. Founded back in 1746 by Presbyterians, it was in the 19th century that Charles Hodge was able to boast of Princeton Seminary. I'm not afraid to say that a new idea has never originated in this seminary. It's a rather clumsy way of saying it. But he's attempted to make it clear that they were abiding in the eternal truth of the gospel. They were not coming up with new fangled ideas. I'm certain that such a claim could not be made of Princeton today. But somewhere within our DNA there is an attraction to new things. And we can often convince ourselves that the new is better. You remember when Paul arrived in Athens? He discovered that the citizens of the city were so fascinated by philosophical innovations, as Luke records in Acts 17, verse 21. Not all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. But new is not always better. As Harry Ironside used to say, If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. Paul gave this warning to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming, he said, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The Athenians of Paul's day had itchy ears and so do we. Therefore we have to set a guard over our hearts that we would not be led away from the truth of the gospel and the authority of God's word. Like the good seed we were thinking about last week that can be snatched away by the evil one, we must ensure that the good seed of the gospel is planted deeply within our hearts, that the rich harvest might be produced. There's a beautiful and touching story told of a young French girl who'd been born blind and after she learned to read by touch a friend gave her a braille copy of Mark's gospel. She read it so much that her fingers became calloused and so insensitive. In an effort to regain her feeling she cut the callous skin from the ends of her fingers. Tragically, however, her calluses were now replaced by permanent and even more insensitive scars. Realising that she could no longer read her gospel in this way, she gave the book a goodbye kiss, saying, Farewell, farewell, sweet word of my heavenly father. But in doing so, she discovered that her lips were even more sensitive than her fingers had been. And from then on, she spent the rest of her life 
reading her great treasure with her lips. What a danger there is for us to allow our hearts to become calloused and insensitive to God speaking to us through his word. We can uh, assume an over-familiarity that is very risky. Rather, we must make ourselves at home in the scriptures and let the scriptures make themselves at home in our hearts and our minds. Let me break off at this point for a little side note. That as you read these words, there's a, a danger that we might think of ourselves as binitarian and not trinitarian. That is, to suggest that God exists in two persons, Father and Son. And you must understand that will always be a danger for the church because of the nature of the work of the Holy Spirit. By nature, the Holy Spirit lives to give glory to the Father and to the Son. He never seeks glory for himself. Like a spotlight that is illuminating some great building, your eye is drawn to look at the building and uh, to marvel at its beautiful architecture. But you, you, you barely understand that there's a, a light source in the foreground that is enabling you to appreciate this beauty. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit can be overlooked because he's always causing our eye to look to the Father and the Son. But he is God, the Holy Spirit. Three in one and one in three. Tom Smeal, who died in 2012, was for a time minister of White Abbey Presbyterian Church before becoming a a significant figure in the British charismatic movement. And he wrote a book called Reflected Glory. In it, he said this. If we ask, how many blessings are there? The New Testament answer is essentially one. God has given us his one gift of himself in his son and everything else is contained in him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3. However many and varied our spiritual experiences, they all have their unity and significance in the fact that they all proceed from him, reflect him and glorify him. He is the centre and the unity of all that comes to us from God. And anything that does not derive ultimately from that centre, whatever its experiential quality, is without Christian value or content. Verse 25, and this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. Promise, that's a devalued word. There are many unkept promises. I'm sure you may well have broken a few in your time. I know I have. And the key to finding hope and help here in this verse is to note the one who makes the promise. And once we recognise this, then we know that what is promised is certain and beyond doubt or question. It is God who makes the promise. And we know that God always keeps his promises. A word of caution here. There are many prosperity preachers who twist the truth to teach that God is only and always going to bring wonderful things into the lives of his children. And the blessings of all his promises are to be experienced in this time and in this place. They are proclaiming what is known as an over-realized eschatology. In other words, they are confusing then and now. Let me explain it like this. God has promised me that I will never get sick then. That I will never be sad then. That I will never die then. I will want for no good thing then. But living in a fallen and perishing world, I know that now I will get sick and sad and die and will want now. 
It's not that God's promises have failed. It is rather that they are yet to be fulfilled. And they will be in the eternal life that he has secured for me. And already there are in breakings of these glimmers of what's yet to be as I experience God's care miraculously in my life. But those who are true believers have this wonderful guarantee that we are safe in God's hands. We can never lose our salvation. As John 10, 29 assures us, the Father has given his chosen to the Son and no one is able to snatch them out of his almighty hand. For the believer, taking up residence in Father and in Son means that we are in the midst of the eternal. Thus, eternal life is assured to us. It is ours, promised to us, secured by Jesus for us. But this does not mean that we can be careless or complacent about these matters of doctrine. Paul urged the Corinthians to hold fast the sound doctrine. He writes at the introduction to that great chapter on resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. He begins, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. The resurrection to eternal life is is the the gift to those who hold fast to God's truth as revealed to us by the Spirit through the Son from the Father. In his book, The Jesus Creed, Scott McKnight shares the moving story of a lady called Margaret Alt. Margaret was completing her PhD at Duke University when she fell in love quite unexpectedly and very welcomely. She went on a date with a man called Hyung Gu Kim, and the sparks flew. But almost as quickly, those uh, sparks were doused by a chilling flood of water, as Hyung Gu informed Margaret that he was HIV positive. Margaret was devastated. She said, I just met someone I liked, and we were definitely not going to live happily ever after. I felt like I'd been kicked in the gut by the biggest boot in the world. Margaret married Hyunggu. And the two loved to walk in the gardens of Duke University. And they became so knowledgeable about the plants that they together supervised the construction of a new project. And in their last spring together, the garden seemed especially beautiful to them. Hyung-gu died in the autumn and Margaret returned in the spring where a memorial garden of roses was being constructed in his honour. And in her book, Sing Me to Heaven, Margaret reflects on the days that she returned to the gardens. She writes, Where peonies were promised, there were only the dead stumps of last year's stalks. Where lilies were promised, there were un pre-possessing tufts of foliage where hostas were promised there was nothing at all and yet I know what lushness lay below the surface those beds that were so brown and empty and to the unknowing eye so unpromising would be full to bursting in a matter of months then she said Is the whole world like this? Is this what it might be to live in expectation, real expectation of the resurrection? Was not Hyung Gu's and my life together like this? Empty and sere, and yet a seedbed of fullness of life for both of us. He died and I was widowed, yet in his dying, we were both made alive. The promise of resurrection to eternal life is the secure and prized possession of all who abide in the Father and the Son. Because of Jesus' death, he secures for us victory over the grave. And if we believe in him, this perfect, sinless Son of God, 
who gave himself for us, we can know God's promises will not fail us. And one day in that glorious yet to be, we will see him face to face and receive all the fulfillment of the promises that we now eagerly anticipate. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. And while there are many who seek to deceive and to cause us to go astray, we thank you that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. He is the way back to the Father. He is the truth about himself and our salvation. And he is the life that, that all who believe in him do not perish but live eternally in your presence. And their sickness and sadness, hunger and want are gone. And we will live forevermore in unbridled joy. In the meantime, may we hold fast to this truth. May we live effectively making much of Jesus, declaring the wonder of his love to the watching world. And may grace, mercy and peace from this triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.